Hello, and welcome to our next presentation. This is day three, of the final day of the symposium. And on behalf of the MIT CDOIQ virtual symposium, we would like to thank all our sponsors who have sponsored the symposium this year. Please keep a lookout for a very special survey that we'll be sending out shortly. In the meantime, let me thank our sponsors, Deloitte, Informatica, Privacy Analytics, Dawix, Fusion Alliance, KPMG, Santo Consultants, Tamer, Relation, Ali Data, Big ID, Bumi, Caserta, Citizen, Data Kitchen, Garage, Okira, Pilog, Click, ThoughtSpot, Eckerson, Global ID, Snowflake, and Starburst. Please take a chance to go to the Content Hub, see what content to have, download that, and if you get a chance, reach out to our partners. Without our partners, we would not be able to hold a symposium. Thank you, and we look forward to seeing you in 2021. Thank you for attending Track C's conversation. Today, Peggy Sai is going to talk about fueling digital transformation with data discovery, along with Cara Daly, the CDO at Silicon Valley. Peggy is currently Vice President of Data Solutions at Big ID. Big ID is an advanced AI data discovery platform that enterprise enterprises identify and protect their customer and entity data on structured and unstructured sources. Peggy, would you like to uh, kick it off and introduce Cara? Thank you, Elizabeth. Um, welcome to everyone today to our session on fueling data discovery with um, data discovery. I'd like to uh, welcome my co-speaker today, Cara Daly. She's the Chief Data Officer at Silicon Valley Bank. Um, and actually, interestingly enough, uh, Cara, you, you do have a quite a bit of history um, with Big ID, and I thought um, I'd like for you to share that with everybody today. Sure. Thanks, Peggy, and thank you, everyone. I'm truly excited to be here, even though it's virtual. Hopefully next year, we'll all be face-to-face. Uh, so, so like Peggy and Elizabeth stated, I'm the Chief Data Officer at Silicon Valley Bank. We are the bank that is fueling the innovation economy. Uh, I do have quite a history with Big ID, one of our best clients. Uh, I was introduced to Big ID back uh, when I was working with uh, Nike, uh, and we were working in the early days of Big ID. So we were, Ann Bradley, myself, more Ann Bradley, um, really helped to, to co-innovate some of the, the products that uh, Big ID now, now has. So I've been with them from a long time back, uh, truly love the product. I think it's a game changer for CDOs, for privacy officers uh, across many organizations. Thank, thanks, Kara. So um, let me just... Uh, share my screen and we will actually be kicking it off. And I thought I would first start by talking about the really the data landscape that many organizations uh, are facing today. Um, they're really creating, so you're, a lot of organizations are creating, storing, um, and are receiving more data than ever before at any point in time in history. Uh, many of the organizations that we talk to are saddled with um, merging uh, legacy infrastructures with their existing uh, applications. And technology teams are also faced with uh, building data warehouses, moving data to the cloud. And that leads to a lot of data duplications and uh, more copies of data actually being stored within their organizations. I mean, in fact, if you can see in this um, iceberg, it's really an analogy of the data um, top 10% of your data that you actually see above the water is actually what organizations use and analyze. And really beneath the, the water is really where the majority of your data lies. Um, it's, it's large, it's bulky, it's dark, it's unknown. It's really where um, a lot of the unstructured sources that we see today um, are, is, is our data. Um, and many financial um, companies that we talk to are really dealing with data that's on a, a, a petabyte level, and that's actually like a million um, gigabytes. Um, so with that type of large amount of data, the sheer amount of data and the volume of data that's really 
moving across um, the organization, it's really difficult to know what your critical data is and where it is at any given point in time. And let's face it today, there's no one person in an organization that really knows, has a complete inventory of the data um, and really knows the relevant business context as well with, with that data. Um, and just this week, I was on a, a customer call uh, with a, a mid-size um, US domestic bank, and they were talking about how they have many separate lines of business and each line of business uh, manage and uh, control their own uh, data sets. And there's no incentive really from the top down uh, management to work on standardizing and really pulling together um, the data. And that's really um, quite common as I see where organizations have these silo data um, and there's no um, initi enterprise initiative to, to work towards um, consolidation. Uh, and the reality is that many organizations have data that's really everywhere. Um, if it was only just in our structured databases, that would be really simple, but life is not, really not that simple. Um, critical data can really be residing anywhere from um, your files that you have on your SharePoint, it's stored in uh, your end user applications, um, it's in your Microsoft Outlook, it's in your Google Drives, um, it's you know data that's moving through your APIs. Um, so the difficulty with having all these different types of data mediums is that organizations end up focusing on you know only one or two of these data sources, and the the other types of you know data mediums they rely on uh, manual reviews to check for critical data, and that's really where the risk lies because you are. Um, depending on um, dependent on these manual processes to find and locate and inventory your critical data. Um, again, the challenges is with all these different types of data formats, you have different naming conventions, you have different data models for, for all these different types of sources. And it's really difficult to create a holistic picture of say, for example, your customer data that resides across all these different types of uh, data sources. So let me talk a little bit about some of the traditional approaches uh, to finding data. Um, so regular expression is, is one common approach and regular expression is when you rely on a sequence of characters or patterns um, to, to find the data. So if, let me take, for example, um, the US social security number that's uh, a standard format of three digit followed by two digits followed by four digits. So it's quite easy to be able to find um, this type of code because it's a preset format. Um, dates is another good example where dates are no normally in the MMDDYYY, so it's month, date, and year. Or if you're in Europe, you actually flip the day and month um, on that sequence. So um, really is um, difficult because it's it takes um, these type of di discovery approaches really with regular expression, it takes trial and error um, to be able to locate all your data. And with the date example, you have to um, you know, code it several ways to make sure you're capturing all the different date formats. Um, and there's also things called false positives um, that you wanna make sure that you, you know, spend time to accommodate and fix. So with all these you know, approaches, there's also things that you can do traditionally where you literally just manually tag your data and you apply category labels to your data sets to try to find it later. But again, this works only for structured environments and it takes uh, a bit of uh, manual intensive work uh, to try to get through uh, your, your entire your data set. So privacy regulations like the um, California Consumer Privacy Act is, has thrown a bit of a monkey wrench, I would say, in terms of how the traditional data discovery works. Um, so let me take again the example of the date. Um, so it's easy for anyone to write a piece of code to, to find a date, but if I'm looking for a, a person's birth date, right, it, it's tied to a particular person, and that what that's what makes it uh, personal information. Um, if I'm writing a code for to find a, a date. I can actually um, find any other type of date in my database. It could be 
I could um, find an account date or transaction date or, um, or you know, the date of, of bank uh, credit card opening. So these are all dates, but the one that I'm specifically looking for that's personal information is obviously a birth date um, that's tied to a, per a person. And that's what makes it sensitive. Um, another good example or personal information is, is, a, is a password. Um, by itself, a, a password is just a, a you know, benign set of characters. It doesn't really mean anything. But again, once it's tied to a person, it makes it um, personal. So location history, cookie setting, IP addresses, um, again, it's all personal information that needs to be found, especially when um, you know, a California resident or customer, California customer of yours looks to delete um, that information. Now, many organizations that we talk to sort of overlook the complexity of personal information because they believe they could just simply look at the metadata, they can hard code exactly where that information is in their um, data systems. But again, this only works well when it's in a structured environment where you know exactly what the column name is for um, all your personal information fields. Um, this, be, this type of um, framework becomes really tricky and it's not scalable, especially when many jurisdictions um, and global regulations are changing and they have different definitions for sensitive data. Um, you know, we see um, different regulations call it regulated data, inferred data, related data. So it's very difficult to um, be able to hard code all, all these instances. So simply relying on patterns and regular expression is, is just not a way to, to be able to be fully compliant uh, with um, current and, and new privacy regulations. Now, what we believe at Big ID is really a, a scalable and a more comprehensive approach to data discovery that's led by um, machine learning. And we're not just looking at metadata, we're looking at the actual content of the data. And that makes it really scalable because we're able to really precisely tell based on the content of the data, um, be able to classify it and identify exactly what it is. And it's, interestingly enough, this leads to a language agnostic approach. Uh, so that's really um, a product difference. Um, now, correlation is another one of the several techniques that we use in data discovery. Uh, so correlation is a way that we can tie together all related information that's specific to a person, and also, you know, we're not just talking personal information here. It can be all related attributes to an entity, an account, a policy number, an insurance number. So it really is ability to find all related information um, and holistically tie it together regardless of uh, your data sources. The, the, third, the third type of um, aspect of data discovery I want to highlight here is just called cluster analysis. And that's really a unique way, especially for your unstructured data to group together or cluster together um, similar files and documents together that have and share uh, similar uh, characteristics. And it's really a great way to really form a high level understanding of your um, unstructured data and really begin to understand deep dive into exactly what you have. Now we talk to a, a lot of uh, chief data officers and um, myself, I sit in several industry working, date working groups where we talk about um, the best practices and um, the standards that we want to have in the industry for, for data management. And one of the first things that we talk about with chief data officers is, you know, before they begun, begin their data management program, before they begin about, before they think about inventorying or cataloging their data, they want to have to classify and, and tag their data. But they want to make sure as well that they know their complete um, inventory availability of all the data. So ensuring that they're, they have complete coverage within the scope, within whatever project they're starting, data discovery really helps them know that they're, they're not really missing out on anything. Um, I know that, you know, oftentimes in the past when I've worked in data organizations, um, you rely on, you know, simply asking your technology counterparts um, how many data elements are there in that I'm working on, right? And again, relies on 
uh, you know, manual efforts to, you know, talk to another technology team that, you know, has to do some research. And then also, you know, um, assuming that they have um, complete knowledge of the, the table and schemas, but then also it's literally just a scope of uh, a structured environment. And secondly, um, many of the uh, manual data governance tasks can really be automated with this type of new uh, data discovery. And what we're talking about is, you know, when you're creating inventory, um, you're creating catalog, you want to be able to auto discover and um, have a tool that really helps you find um, and um, find these new, new, new sources that are out there. Um, and one really great point is how physical copies or physical instantiations can be auto discovered through data discovery and be linked to um, your business glossary. So a lot of that manual work that a lot of your data stewards may be doing in terms of identifying and finding your data can be automated. Um, and that's really critical here. You want to, a third point here is to continuously monitor um, your data across all your different uh, data sources, um, especially as you know we're talking about the volume of the data as it continues to grow. Um, this type of automated um, data discovery can really augment um, and help with completeness and, and accuracy in your, in your program. So I want to also talk about how data discovery fits into um, the, the you know, end to end data lifecycle management. I know um, many organizations as they're building out their data governance programs, they're not boiling the ocean. There's, you know, simply um, the most pragmatic way is you, you really start out with small scopes with uh, one particular line of business or one data domain and, and start to um, govern and um, understand and evaluate that data. So the very first step around scoping, this is where, again, data discovery can, can really help and play a role in making sure that uh, the, the data that's being used in, in that project is, is complete and that you're not missing out on any critical data sources or data sets. Um, the next step around assessing the data is you know, around you know, standardizing data, ensuring the quality of data. And that's where really um, data discovery that we're talking about can help with uh, profiling your data, statistically monitoring that and identifying uh, changes. And that's where this good opportunity for, for rules and for thresholds to help with um, the continuous monitoring of, of that data. And the next part is around the business impact. And that's really where your, your data stewards play a role in uh, providing the business context and um, your subject matter experts may also participate in making sure that um, the data is, is tagged for the appropriate use. Um, and the data discovery process that we're talking about also can collect business, technical, operational metadata that can help with um, doing the proper business impact. And the last piece again is um, recalibrate. And I like to think of that as, you know, you're, um, you're checking at the very end, making sure there's no missed data um, scopes, um, data elements, and you rinse and repeat. You're repeating the same process and you continue to grow and expand uh, the number of um, data sets, data domains that's in your, your data program. So I'd like to take this moment actually to just do a uh, the here and your thought um, love from everyone what is really your your biggest issue that you've been having in terms of your your journey to data governance and um, you know we can see some of the responses at the end of the presentation but um, the first option is uh, data discovery uh, it's you find it hard to um, find all your critical and related um, data. It's, uh, it's a really tough uh, process for you. Or at number two, uh, regulations, um, you know, especially with uh, the privacy regulations with GDPR and um, California Consumer Privacy Act. Um, and also in within banks, there may be um, additional regulations. All these regulations are challenging and, you know, it's hard to keep up with from a data management perspective. A uh, third option is lack of standards and processes, especially within the organization. There may might not be a consistent process or framework um, for all uh, data, um, data organizations to follow. 
And the fourth is technology. Is this your biggest issue, a challenge in data governance is a lack of tooling and interoperability between all your various uh, data tools. So please take a moment um, and, uh, and vote below. And at this point, I'd love to have um, Kara, you, you know, join me in the presentation and really talk about uh, the data governance program that you have at uh, Silicon Valley Bank and the impact that data discovery has had in building out and rolling out your program. Great. Uh, thank you, Peggy. Uh, also, the poll is still open, so please vote. We always want to be, uh, you know, hear from you and what your what your biggest challenges are. So you just need to scroll on down and and vote, and I we can see the responses are coming in. So, data governance at Silicon Valley Bank. Uh, for many of you, I'm sure there's many CDOs in the audience, many data governance leaders. You know, we all know that this role is not for the faint of heart, right? Data governance. Uh, is a massive undertaking for many companies that haven't invested in foundational data infrastructure, uh, practices around data management and data quality. So oftentimes CDOs are coming into a blank slate or repairing a program that went wrong. Uh, for me at Silicon Valley Bank, I uh, came into a bit of a blank slate. I joined the bank uh, two years ago. And if we go to the next slide, I'll articulate you know, what our program is uh, and was at the time. And, and one is we rooted our data governance program. And I, I don't always like to use the word governance, our data program. We rooted it in the corporate strategy for SVB. And so our corporate strategy, one of the one of the major swim lanes for our corporate strategy is about improving the client experience, which is probably fairly common these days. And it's all about you know our digital journey, our digital transformation, and how the client how we put the client at the center of that, right? So we we rooted our data strategy in corporate strategy, which I always think is a great thing. It makes it it makes your data program so very relevant relevant the second thing that we did is we also took a look at all right what does the foundation look like at svb in terms of what are the foundational data capabilities right and again you've got to translate it for the business but did we have you know data owners data stewards did we have you know um a central repository did we have metadata management did we have data discovery we didn't have any of that so over the last two years we've been focused on building that foundation and really through the modern lens so our our program is very cloud first uh, we have invested in a big id in fact that we're in the middle of an implementation but also the broad set of uh, data capabilities and more modern cloud architecture, we've been working on that. So with the first one is we're aligning to our corporate strategy. The second is we're building, found, we're, we're building the foundation. What do we want to enable? Well, our organization works with the best and brightest right? We're Silicon Valley Bank. We're a global bank. Our clients are the best clients in the world. They're literally solving real world problems. So in order for us to serve them better, we wanted to ensure that we had analytical capabilities, world-class analytical capabilities. And also, by the way, many of our clients create this. Right, so I know we've got Snowflake here, one of our clients. We have ThoughtSpot. You know, many of our clients are these world-class companies, and we should be we should be employing some of that that into our data framework. And last but not least, we wanted to ensure that we had data risk management covered. And this is a topic that I've been thinking about. I would say really in the last two years is. You know, I'm a I'm a former CDO that went through a C car with Bank of the West, and so for all my financial services CDOs, I think that are that are in that they know how difficult that is. And so, how do we best manage risk going forward? C car taught me a lot of things. 
taught me a lot about quality controls. It taught me a lot about risk management. So really wanted to build a construct around data risk management and the tie to privacy and security. So that's really our, our overview of the program, our goals, uh, what we're getting after. Why don't we go to the next slide? Oh, and by the way, quick pause. We're up to 39, 35, 39 responses. So this is the, the polling's going well. Okay. Keep it coming. Yeah. All right. Keep going. Okay. So now let's zoom in on data discovery, right? For us, we definitely needed to know where all the personal data lives, right? And so our, our company right now is going through its own growth cycle. Um, we're in a hyper growth stage. We've got, uh, lots of kind of old manual processes that, that have been, you know, haven't been cared for. So really when it comes to understanding and knowing where all our personal data is, we really need to look at more of the unstructured side of the house. Um, we also need to scale. Right. So with these new regulations, we were doing a lot of the privacy impact assessments and all of that very manually. And that takes a ton of time. And we wanted to look at tooling out there that could be an accelerator. Right. And we see Big ID as a huge accelerator for us. We also needed it to connect directly with our new data architecture that we're building and our old on prem data architecture that we're building. And so there's capabilities on the, on the data discovery side around hooking into those existing systems and being able to spider the information. And that's just going to be, you know, a big, uh, accelerator for you guys out there, because let's be honest, as soon as you write something down, it becomes old and stale and no one's really looking at documentation. You need something live. And last but not least, we see, we see uh, the, the data discovery platform, which for us is big ID, but there's others out there. We see that as a huge uh, part of the overall data framework that we're building towards. So why don't we go to the next slide? Okay. Now, how do you mature, right? We all know how to build, right? We know how to kind of set, set the foundation, but how do you really build? And this is where we are in our journey right now is we've laid the foundation We've got data in the cloud uh, and really we're now starting to activate uh, many of the business use cases. Now, this is a challenge and it's a challenge for, for every, every company out there, right? In terms of how do you connect the data management program or the data program that you're building to your business use cases, what's going to touch the client, that kind of thing. Um, so for us, what we did is uh, we pulled together the really like key business stakeholders. I call them all the heads of the family. So all the different lines of business heads, right? And we brought them together and we talked about why data and analytics is so important for the company. Everybody's like, check. Yes, I get it. And now we want to talk about, all right, what can we do or how might we do something better with data and analytics to fuel your business use cases. So we inventory that. So if you think about, you know, the CDO tends to have to be the head of sales for data for the company. You're, you are selling it, right? So you need a funnel, right? And this becomes your funnel. So we really brought in these tangible use cases, use cases that touch the client, touch, or it might be internal use cases um, that make employees' lives better, which is great, right? Automation and efficiency. We really focused on those business outcomes, right? The second thing when we started to like really mature the program was we built, we're building more of a pragmatic approach and it's right size for our organization, right? So this means we're identifying data stewards in the lines of business. It's going to be a federated model for us. It just is you know, we started with a centralized model and it just was too much of a bottleneck. And now we're pivoting fast into a more federated version of that. And our data stewards, we've got enterprise data stewards that are focused more on master data domains 
And then our federated stewards are more functional data stewards and they're focusing on business line domains. So again, you know, when you're maturing your program, you got to see what fits for the organization. It's got to be right size and what like level of interest your executive committee has for this. And you got to, you got to kind of mature it that way. Also, and third, and this might have, should have been probably first is you have to get buy-in for your program from your executive committee, your board, um, and your senior leadership around the table. I mean, I can't say enough good things about our executive committee and how much they leaned in when we came in and um, positioned a more modern data, data infrastructure. Uh, we also connected it to our digital transformation. So by making it relevant and getting buy-in from your executive committee, your, your senior leaders, you pave your own way, right? You can mature your program. You can get the funding for your program. And then number four is really about automation and innovation, right? So while you can connect to business outcomes, you can create a pragmatic governance structure that's right-sized for your organization, got to get buy-in from your executive committee, and then just automate. Automate as much as you can. And obviously, it's a big ID. They've got a great tool for that. Let's go to the next slide. And I think I'm doing okay on time. If anybody has any questions, I know you're waiting to the end, but feel free. I've got the chat window open so I can see the questions. So please feel free to ask questions. So now we're pivoting towards the future, right? And we've got the cloud, uh, we're personally, we're on Amazon Web Services, uh, and now we're starting to look at, okay, how do we get data into the cloud faster? And I ask this of everybody because I just want it to move faster. Uh, so we're looking at, you know, uh, especially on data discovery capabilities, just tagging, right? We need to be more automated in how we tag, how we ingest information, pipeline management, right? That's all those things are, are going to help us. Um, in terms of data discovery, I got a question here. Why did we choose Big ID? Um, that's a good question. Uh, <laughs> Peggy, Peggy wants to know. Um, well, I mean, to, to, be, to be fair, we looked at a number of different vendors in this space. Uh, so my partner on the privacy side, he and I got together and we kind of looked at a smattering of partners. I, full disclosure, I did say that I had experience with Big ID. I had lots of good things to say, but I really wanted the privacy and security team to make these type of decisions because it does kind of this, this particular tool kind of lands with them. Um, I think for us, when we looked at Big ID, the capability around just hooking into on-prem systems and being able to pull back the, the kind of pattern matches around the PII, that was a huge sell, like a huge sell for us. And then also the user interface is slick. It's very easy to use. You know, I think the whole automation is really key. And then I know that, and this is just my relationship with the company, is they're also building out some data governance capabilities uh, around things like lineage. And I knew that. So that was my offer in is like, I, I knew the company and, and I had, and, and there's, a, there's a lot of great capabilities coming from them. So that was, that was our reasoning behind Big ID. Um, as for, uh, I'll keep going on the future use cases. You know, another thing that I think uh, many CDOs struggle with is data quality, right? And I know that there's a session after this around data quality, but you know, how do we get faster at identifying issues and fixing them? Because it's a long road on, on data quality, right? And if there's things that we can kind of pass through the pipeline because we know are wrong and we can fix that on the fly, that's great. Um, and so I think these are the types of tooling um, that, that can help. Let's see, we have another question. Do you believe the digital transformation initiatives are effective processes? Um, I think that for us on the digital transformation side, our, what digital transformation means to us as a bank is we are uh, reinventing our online banking uh, tooling, right? So how we interface with our clients through a digital way, that's us. 
you cannot do that without the data, right? And you can't do that without clean and consistent and complete data. And so that's why we really tied our digital transformation to our data governance processes, because it's so important. A very tangible use case around this, and this is, this is really like in the beginning of, of my journey with SVB, is um, can, you know, we took our client onboarding process, digitized it, because it was, believe it or not, it was all paper. It digitized our onboarding processes, right? And then we hooked our master data uh, uh, management uh, database to that, right? So while we're onboarding the client and they're entering their name, their address, all the personal information, it's all coming into a client master. And so I think that was actually a, a, a pretty uh, tangible use case because all the valid values that list that were all the reference data that was housed in master data management in that client master was used in the drop down. So you had a well controlled uh, throughput of information. And you all know for data quality, garbage in, garbage out, because we were actually controlling the information at point of creation, we can then trust, and of course you gotta put controls on, but you can then trust the data that's coming in from client master, and then it would feed the downstream. So that's a long journey, MDM, it's a very long journey, but um, that's a, a pretty tangible example around digital transformation. What if the data is not on premise, but on the cloud? Well, so for us, um, and I am, and, and Elizabeth, keep, keep me honest on time, because I'll just keep talking. <laughs> um, in terms of uh, that question, so we have a mix, uh, and most of our data is on-prem, um, but we've been, over the last several years, you know, uh, procuring tooling that's SaaS-based, but we never really put data in the cloud. And by the way, if you think that oh, we've got some apps in the cloud and it's SaaS, that's data going to the cloud. It's not. The journey for data to the cloud is, is, uh, is a interesting one. And I suggest everybody to like, before you embark on a cloud journey to definitely educate yourselves around it. It is, a, it is uh, it's complicated, right? It's complicated how you secure that information, how you um, pipe that information into the cloud. Uh, that's, that is, uh, definitely, a, a challenging journey. And so, you know, if your data is all in the cloud, then, you know, there's ways to control it. But if you're going from on-prem to the cloud, there's lots of security controls that have to be put in place to make sure that that data is, is of good quality. And actually I have a use case later on in the presentation that does talk about how big ID can help with, uh, moving your data to the cloud as well. So. Stay tuned for that. And I've landed on this page for a long time. So then why don't we go to the next one? I just realized I got more pages here. Data risk management. I'm still fielding questions, so keep them, keep them coming. Um, so we talked about the program. We talked about our goals. We talked about why data discovery is so important. We matured data governance. And now we're talking about future, we talked about future use cases. Now let's talk about data risk management and why that's so important, right? We need to ensure that through the entire data management life cycle, right? From cradle to grave, data is well controlled. It's organized. People own it, right? That's really around data management. You want to have a really good policies around your data. You want to have, a, and, it, and a policy, you know, doesn't mean anything unless you have implemented it. So make sure that you do that. Uh, I, think, I think many companies struggle with that. Um, and then have a way to test that you are complying with those policies, right? Um, I would say also, and from a data risk management standpoint, make sure as a CDO, you have a tight connection with your privacy officer, with your security officer. The three of you, the data, privacy, and security officer should be working all together on this construct around data risk management. Your policies should speak to one another, right? Because that's the, the underpinnings of all of it is the data, right? The data is flowing, right? Um, so privacy and security is very important to ensure that your frameworks tie to each other. It's 
especially when you think about the target operating model that you want to employ at your company around data and privacy and security, you want to make sure that that all ties. Uh, you know, in, in financial services, in many places, we talk about first line, second line of defense. You want to make sure that you've got good first line defense, second line defense. I know data governance often uh, hangs out in this one and a half line of defense, which by the way, is not a thing. Uh, so you got to <laughs> Kind of really like separate what's considered first line, what's considered second second line. Uh, if you don't figure that out, your regulators will. If you're in a bank, <laughs> um, and last but not least, you also have to have a tight connection with that compliance and risk, right? So that's that second line of defense, right? I'm gonna go to questions because I see them rolling in. Great, great. What specific tools are best for developing an initial understanding of relationships among within data? that will guide use of more sophisticated techniques. So um, I'll talk a little bit about SVB and then we'd love to hear from Peggy on this question, the tooling. Um, for us on, let's talk about metadata management. So uh, we, we use, and, and there's data discovery, there's catalog, and then there's business glossary. I'm gonna talk about the business glossary. So right now uh, we have implemented Calibra um, we call it the one data catalog. So we've marketed our data ecosystem as one data. So one data platform is the lake, MDM is one data master, we got one data catalog, um, but it's really the business glossary, uh, but it sounded good. Um, we use Calibra as that business interface, right? So as you come in and, you know, if you think about it as like a grocery store, you know, it's a well-organized uh, area where it's got clearly labeled aisles and you can go and you know what's in every aisle. You know, that's, that's really the beauty of, of our One Data Catalog is that We've got our key data elements live, right? It makes your data governance program tangible and real. And that's what you have to get towards, right? And so that's why, I mean, I don't usually lean on tools to sell the strategy, but we, we uh, has, have spent a lot of time on that. And we're also spending a lot of time on developing that literacy program that's kind of, uh, the cornerstone of that is, is around metadata management, right? And we use a Calibra and a number of different catalogs for that. Do you want to take a stab at that, Peggy? Back no, back? Yeah, I, I was, I was going to cover this, um, answer that question, but also talk about, um, you know, great timing with my next slide talking about how we see a lot of organizations um, look at their data, how they can start looking at their metadata, the actual data itself, and start to make sense of it, right? And obviously at the end of the day, it's the insights, it's the um, analytics that you can get out of it. But, you know, so where do, where do you actually start? So this is actually the, um, what Big ID call, what we call the C4 stands for the four C's that you see in the middle. It's catalog, classify, cluster, and correlate. And this is really our multi-approach to uh, data discovery foundation. Um, there's actually a fifth C, uh, many people don't actually know about it, and it's um, the coverage, C for coverage. And the ability for us to look um, across your complete data landscape. So a question on, you know, cloud, um, you know, all your unstructured, your applications, people ask us about Workday, Microsoft Outlook, Google, Slack, it's complete, uh, all complete, uh, you know, set of your data. So this is what we can look at, what we can um, analyze and start covering. Um, so let me just start briefly with uh, what we call correlation. And it's one of our um, patented methods that we have. So if we're, if, whether we're looking at a person or entity or an account, we're able to, through our correlation methodologies, find all the related and inferred information that's tied to a person. And if you recall back to my slide on privacy, this is where it becomes really nitty gritty that it's not just um, simply the personal identifiable that we're looking for, it's the related information that related to a person or to an account. 
that needs to be surfaced. And regardless of where it is in an organization, we're able to find it and surface it and show it to you in, in a diagram. Um, cluster, clustering analysis, again, you think about clustering, it's a grouping. It's really helpful, especially for your, your unstructured data. Um, when, before you begin any type of governance program, you, before you decide on what tactical strategies you're gonna actually implement, um, you need to have an understanding of what type of data is in your unstructured environment. So clustering really helps uh, with labeling and putting um, you know, a, a plan in place on how you're gonna be governing that unstructured data. Um, classification, again, I think this is like really the most important thing that we actually talk about with all our chief data officers is that they're applying classification manually or they're relying again on you know, regular expression to classify, but we, we do both. We do pattern matching, but we also do uh, machine learning classification on your data, on your metadata, and on your documents. So three, three ways that we can classify. It's, it's really innovative because not only are you um, looking at your data, you can, put, uh, you can start to classify your invoices, um, your bills, and, and put all these buckets together on what all these documents are. So obviously OCR is part of our repertoire as well. And lastly, with all these um, insights that you get from your correlation, your classification, you wanna see it in one place. And that's really our catalog. It's really bringing together all these different insights that we've um, identified through our scanning and our profiling. And we put it together in one place. It's like what we call single pane view of all your technical, all your business metadata, um, you know, across all your sources. And you know it's it's linked to your business glossary as well. So it's it's a really a complete, comprehensive, technical uh, view of your data. And you know that, and you will know that because we're machine learning automated, um, it will be um, updated on a regular basis. So it's it's sort of that continuous monitoring that uh, many organizations uh, uh, are looking to achieve. Great. This is great, Peggy. That's a really good overview. Oh, we still we still have more. Just, okay. you know, just, just one more slide before okay. uh, you got, you got um, use cases, uh, Kara. Again, um, you, you mentioned earlier, Kara, uh, when you looked at Big ID, it wasn't just from a TDO perspective. You were looking at your privacy and security counterparts to make sure that they were also in agreement with Big ID because we really do serve all three personas. Um, and on top of the um, discovery platform, we, we built specific capabilities, we call them applications. So think of it as, you know, your iPhone and these are the apps that you have. So we built very specific apps to cater to the chief privacy uh, officer, whether it's fulfilling a data subject access request or doing consent governance or having a privacy portal available. These are available in our apps. And from our, for our data security teams, we have a data remediation app where you know, um, you know, security teams and data teams can start to fix um, the data set, the data that they see um, incorrect. Um, the last part is perspective. It's also governance. Uh, we had to name them all th three Ps. Um, so, but perspective, governance, especially when it comes to um, data quality, data retention, these are key repeating themes that we see under the remit of a chief data officer. And we built very specific capabilities um, that can apply for all. So imagine data quality is a very good example. Um, you're not just um, many tools use conduct data quality and give you a data quality score on a table on one specific database. That's about it. But if you think about doing data quality on on top of our data discovery platform, we cover all your sources. Um, so imagine having a complete data quality score on your customer data. So regardless of where your customer data is, we're gonna be able to provide you a more comprehensive and holistic um, understanding of your data quality. And I know, Kara, that's uh, one of your um, main um, objectives is around data quality and being able to not just do, you know, data quality on one particular table, you know, being able to expand that to um, your customer data, for example, regardless of where that is, is, is really powerful and, and meaningful to a chief data officer. 
Absolutely. Absolutely. Data quality is definitely at the cornerstone of that. I'm just going to hang on for one more minute and we're going to answer some of these questions because a very interesting question came in. Oh, um, how to resolve territorial wars in departments and companies to control data and analytics in a data and a governance framework. So look, right. I, I think, I think that's an interesting question because you know, analytics tends to be federated across the company, which I actually think it should be, right? So I think where data and data, your data program may not be mature and data governance may not be embedded in the DNA of the company, then you got to centralize data, right? You got to pull it in and you got to build those central capabilities and offer that out to the organization. But when it comes to analytics, don't you want everyone to use the data? So if you do, like if you want everyone to be data driven and you want to teach them the fish, you, you need to let those analytics teams be as close to the front end as possible, right? So it's okay if there are multiple analytics teams, but what you need to kind of mandate, and I do mean mandate because sometimes you have to, you have to be the stick here is that they use the data capabilities that the CDO team is creating, right? You need to use the data that's centralized, that's certified, right? So maybe you have a set of enterprise KPIs, right? And they're certified by the business. You've got owners on them. Everybody agrees with the logic. You don't want an analytics team over on another, in, in, in a geography, having a different KPI than that. They could be doing different what if analysis about the, the KPI and that's fine. You, you have to kind of figure out what's considered your prioritized enterprise data that has to be used centrally, what you let those analytics teams do. And you gotta create a community for those analytics teams because I'm willing to bet they all kind of wanna work together or at the, at the analyst level, at the scientist level, they absolutely do, right? So bring those teams together, make it a like community, create a center of practice, right? And then make sure that the data is well-managed, centralized, available, right? I know in mo more modern companies, it's, it's a less of a centralized uh, strategy. I'm, for, for me, I'm in financial services, so we, we need to adopt a more traditional um, centralized way. Um, but that that's definitely you know, my feedback on that. I love to talk about that. Like, look, as a CDO, you've got to be a bridge builder. You've got to be a bridge builder. You don't want to be a BI team. That's so 2006 and, and, yeah. and you don't want to do that. No one wants to do that anymore. I ran a BI team back at GE Capital and it's hard, right? You're building dashboards for everybody. You don't want to do that. You want to teach people how to build their own dashboards off of the good, connected, clean, and complete data that you're offering to the organization. Uh, let me see, we've got some more questions and we have a few more minutes. Um, should companies employ chief data officers on their boards? Well, that's a cool question. Um, I, I don't know on the board. I mean, I think I, I'm very lucky. Uh, our board members are very data savvy. Um, in fact, our newest board member is also so board member from Calibra. Uh, so, so I'm, I'm, I was always very lucky that they were very tuned in on data and data as a strategy. Um, I do think that the chief data officer needs to be positioned well in the organization. I know some chief data officers sit in IT, some chief data officers sit in the business. I currently report to our chief financial officer or CFO. Um, I think my role in the business is more impactful for SVB because I get to set the priorities for data. I'm the product, you could look at me as like, I'm the product owner for data. I'm the product owner is a business person, right? And, and I have an IT counterpart who's fantastic. And uh, I think the relationship that you have to have with your IT counterpart needs to be solid. Mm -hmm. uh, and you need, and if it's not, you need to work on it. You need to work on it every day. Um, but uh, chief data officers, I, I think, you know, on the boards, maybe not so much, but 
I think, you know, close to the executive committee, one down from the executive committee, that's where I sit. Um, I think it's important. Gives weight to the role. Um, okay, let's see. Any more questions? Ah, oh, Ryan Smith totally agrees with me. We work together at Nike. <laughs> um, I don't see any more questions. Uh, Peggy, do you have anything else uh, to, to add as we wrap up? Uh, we do have a few more slides maybe, Kara. We can just talk about um, your perspective on the, the data catalog and the uh, ID. So we just have two or three more slides left. Okay. Um, well, so from a data, like, why do you need a data catalog, right? Like that, that, you know, why don't you need all these tools? You know, exactly. data been here forever, right? So I think, you know, one thing is, is if you're really building a construct around analytics and you've got lots of different analytics teams popping up everywhere, it's really important that you have a, a good data catalog because that way people understand, okay, what's in this data platform? How is it defined? How does it connect to the architecture? And then you've got your, and for us, we layer that business glossary on top so you can see who owns it, the definition. Um, I think it's extremely, uh, extremely important on the data catalog side um, that you have that tooling for, for your analytics teams. Um, so that's, that's why we think it's important. Um, this classification piece is, is also very important. I mean, I think, look, no one's like manually tagging data. If you are, I feel bad. You have to get some tools <laughs> to do it in a more automated way. It's not a scalable solution for you. And, um, you know, if you're going to the cloud, uh, this is absolutely something you need to, to be doing. Um, you've got to be tagging your information. Uh, and then last but not least, data retention. This, and at, uh, I know I'm looking at the time, we've got 8.12, so we've got three minutes left. Um, data retention, I actually own the data retention policy for SVB. I probably shouldn't, it's a, a great debate, <laughs> uh, but I do. <laughs> this tool, I mean, I, honestly, like there, you really have to have a construct to implement retention. And having, uh, and you can see on the picture here, having a dashboard that can show you where you've got your retention policy implemented, where you've still got gaps and issues that need to be remediated. That's really important to have as part of kind of your CDO remit uh, around retention. Because uh, like Peggy said earlier on, you know, we all tend to be data hoarders and we never get rid of data. And that creates so much risk for a company, especially as we start to look at all these emerging regulations. Um, and I just wanted to cover the case again, cloud migration. This is a big priority at SVB and many other um, companies that we're talking to as well that's about to embark on the cloud. You don't really want to, no one wants to you know, do a lift and shift. You don't want to take all your multiple copies of data and move it over to your cloud. That's really not, the purpose of the cloud. So really being able to inventory, you want to be able to know what you're gonna be deleting, minimizing the duplications. And this is where um, Big ID can, can really help. We look across and identify all your duplications, very similar data sets, yeah. and then have applications that can help you with uh, deleting um, and removing those copies of data. So really about yeah. reducing the risk um, in, in your data. And I. I believe we have to wrap up. We're getting the, the good old, like, wrap it up. <laughs> Peggy, I'll, I'll, uh, I'll just wrap up my stuff and I'll give you the, the final, final word here. Thank you for the time. I had a lot of fun sharing all the wonderful things that we're doing at SVB around data governance and our data capabilities. Uh, and again, data discovery is so important to your journey. Make sure that you, you bring in the right tools for that. Peggy, any last words? Thank you, Kara, for um, speaking with us at Big ID on this important topic. And we um, believe that data discovery is really critical to your data governance transformation journey. So if anyone has any questions, feel free to um, reach out to us. And thank everyone for your time today.